Great. Hello, this is Martin Brosman, and I'm representing the proposed White House Council on of Boys and Men. And along with me, we have Warren Farrell and Ian Dwyer. And Ian Dwyer is with the Canadian Association for Equality. And we're talking about Warren Farrell's presentation on Boys to Men, Transforming the Boys' Crisis into Our Sons' Opportunities, which he gave at their the CAFE and the L of T Men's Issue Awareness Club. Uh, Ian, would you first just start describing the club and, uh, and uh, how you brought Warren in? Absolutely. So uh, CAFE itself uh, start is an organization that helps to set up, set up campus groups. Uh, we started uh, about a year ago uh, with a mandate to explore um, underrepresented gender issues. Uh, so our, the very first thing we did was start our Men's Issues Awareness Campaign, uh, of which the U of T group is a small part. Uh, we, mostly what we do is host educational events. Uh, we've had, in the past, we've had Barbara Kay, uh, who's a columnist up here in Canada. Uh, she spoke about uh, family law issues. Uh, and then we had Lionel Tiger as well, uh, he spoke about men's health. Uh, we've had several other speakers as well, uh, some local professors, things like that. Uh, inviting Dr. Farrell up was our most ambitious event yet. Um, we're very pleased at uh, how it turned out overall. Um, but what really surprised us was uh, the response that we received from the, from the U of T community. Uh, we had the, the U of T is University of Toronto. For yes, yes, sorry, yes, U University of Toronto community. Uh, we put up posters promoting the event. Uh, many of them were vandalized or torn down. Uh, the, there were nasty articles written about us uh, in, um, in some online publications. The, we have our U of T club ratified by the campus life. So this, I'm, I'm not exactly clear on the university politics here, but we have it ratified by the university, but the student council has still not ratified it. Uh, and they've been very slow getting back to us. They're always, they never seem to have any answers for when our club will be ratified. Uh, we are starting to think that there's probably some deliberate delays there. Uh, and then finally, the, the most surprising part of this event uh, was when the Department of Social Work at Ryerson, or at least someone who works for the department, uh, sent out an email to all of the social work students uh, going over some of the repeating some of the negative press we had received. Um, and then finally, the event itself, we had people come in and block the doors, uh, refuse to allow others in. They were verbally abusive to people who wanted to get in. Uh, and finally, it ended up taking the police coming in and uh, clearing the doors before we were able to get people inside. And this is really important. Warren, would you just uh, take a second to introduce yourself and uh, give a little bit of the background and what you were going to do uh, uh, present at this event? And Yes, basically, I'm Warren Farrell, and uh, part of my background is having been on the board of directors of the um, National Organization for Women in New York City for, for three years, and then I spoke all around the world on women's issues. and. Um, and then I began to start seeing in the mid-70s that there were a lot of divorces occurring and that children were really beginning to have a, a failure to launch when they didn't have their fathers involved. And so I began to investigate that and, and saw the importance of father involvement, began to articulate that. And then as I did that, um, a number of feminists sort of felt that I, a sort of socialist worker party type feminist militant or Marxist type feminist felt that men already ran the world and therefore having men have equal rights to be involved with their children was not what they uh, felt was wanted. Uh, they felt that the mothers knew best as to what uh, was best for children and I said, gee, that's mothers know best is as biased as uh, fathers know best. And so that sort of standing up for that part of equality um, got me into trouble with a number of people in the feminist movement and um, and that trouble was reinforced when I wrote a book called The Myth of Male Power and The Myth of Male Power began, began to be a, a, a book that explained that power was not about um, just scaling ladders and um, and making money uh, that, that men had defined power mistakenly from my perspective as feeling obligated to earn money that somebody else spent while they died sooner to a large degree and that real power is about control over their life and then that began to sort of create some um, upsetness about, on the part of feminists and I was always um, saying that you know institutional power 
um, success money that was obviously held to a much greater degree um, by men throughout the industry, throughout much of the world. But the uh, personal power, the choices that people ideally would have to control their own life, that was much more a result of a division of labor where neither men nor women had power. Both sexes had obligations. Both sexes had responsibility um, in, the, in the everyday life of the home. And so when I came to the University of um, Toronto campus, um, one of my, I started first explaining what the boy crisis is, looking at um, facts like in education, for example, uh, for the first time in US history, and it's very close to this in Canada, our sons will have less education than their dads. And in the area of like suicide or mental health, uh, one example of that is that when boys and girls are at age um, nine and 10, uh, their suicide rate is exactly the same. But as boys learn the rules of masculinity um, between the ages of 11 and uh, 14, um, boys have a double the rate of suicide. Between the ages of 15 and 19, it's four times the rate of suicide. Between the ages of, tw of 20 and 24, it goes to between five and six times the rate of suicide. And so we have to ask a question is, you know, are the rules of masculinity um, rules that are serving boys? And obviously when a boy commits suicide, his sister and his family are deeply uh, tr and tragically um, upset, as is most of the school and the community. Um, we have to look at video addiction and what's happening with our sons. Why do our sons play video games almost three times um, as many hours per week to the addiction level as our daughters? Um, and what's happening with jobs? Why are our boys so inflexible in terms of moving uh, from standard male-only jobs to jobs that are more likely to be available in the future, which are to a much greater degree female jobs? We're moving from an era of muscle uh, to where boys were dominant to an area of, area of mental where girls and boys are much more even. And when girls dominate and women dominate the jobs that are more mentally oriented, uh, we have to start asking, uh, you know, what are we doing in our school system to create uh, vocational opportunities for boys that aren't academically oriented and, the, and help boys become more able to catch up in terms of reading and writing. So when we see the 66% of the Canadian uh, dropouts in high school are males and that there's tremendous, and the reading scores of boys in, in th throughout every province in Canada with no exception, is um, is significantly below um, girls, and the same with the writing scores. Uh, then we say, just for to our with our sons, the exact same thing we would say to our father with our with our daughters. We say we need to make sure that both our daughters and our sons are simultaneously uh, doing well, not just that we have all the magnifying glass on our daughters and no magnifying glass at all um, on our sons. Well, uh, Warren, I want to just take a minute uh, for people listening to find out how they can learn more about both of the groups, and then I want to continue in case somebody needs to step out. Uh, would you state how they can get more information about what you're doing, and then, uh, Ian, if you do the same? Um, sure. Um, for If a person wants more contact with me, my email address is available on my website, which is www.warren feral.com and Warren is W-A-R-R-E-N and Farrell is F as in Frank A-R-R-E-L-L dot com and then on the front home page of warrenferrell.com is my email and probably the book that will is most helpful for somebody that cares enough to to if you're very thoughtful and you really want an explanation of how everything fits together with male and female and cross-cultural and legislative and um, communication issues. Probably my best book for that purpose is a book called The Myth of Male Power. That's M-Y-T-H of Male Power. And there's a separate website for either The Myth of Male Power or just go to uh, warrenferrell.com and it will refer you. Excellent. And Ian, would you just state how people can get more information about your group? Uh, your audio's off, so you'll... Sorry, there we go. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, so the best way to get in touch with our group is at our website, equalitycanada.com. It's right there on the screen. Uh, EQ. Alternatively, we have a meetup group that keeps track of all of our events. Uh, and finally, there is you can also get in touch with us on Facebook, again, uh, Equality Canada.
uh, if you search for that, we will come up. Excellent. I want to take it back to Warren, and, and Warren, can you explain a little bit more about this disruption and uh, what occurred in it as well and the response to it? Because it looks like the main media, any media that picked it up, focused more on the disruption than even finding out what was going on. They, they did, and I will um, actually maybe el elaborate on the information I presented at the um, at the Uni University of Toronto. But maybe Ian, could you take over the uh, disruption because you have an update, much more up to date, and uh, you're you're there finding out what's mm -hmm. happening. Has have any of the media, for example, covered this, like the 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 Globe and Mail or the um, you know the National Post? Uh, we did get a brief mention on uh, Global News and I believe on City TV as well. I'm not 100% sure on the City TV. Uh, aside from that, most of the coverage has been campus papers. Uh, the, the media I did speak to, I spoke to the National Post uh, locally, or rather, not locally, they're a national paper. Uh, and several other people uh, did do interviews. As far as I know, I don't think any of them made it to air. Uh, the main thing I heard from media people is that it was difficult for them to construct uh, a story, uh, to create a narrative, because they weren't really able to get a handle on what the protesters were about. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. I, I don't want to sound like I'm belittling them, but it No, honestly, I understand. I understand. Uh, the, the, Warren, you, you want to add something to that? Because there's sure. something here that they missed the point of the talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, first of all, <clears throat> let me maybe explain what I think the protesters were concerned with. Um, from w when you have a Marxist feminist perspective, which the Socialist Workers Party does, um, your your basic belief is that uh, a patriarchy rules the world, and that the patriarchy is a system of laws and rules made by men to benefit men at the expense of women. And so, finally, from th their perspective, and th and this is basically the belief that reigns at every prestigious and major university in the industrialized world. Uh, that I that I'm aware of, and so, and so, and once that frame is established, then the belief is that that men are the um, they are the oppressors, they are the rapists, they are the serial killers, they are the people that are preventing women from getting equal access to power. Uh, they are, in a sense, the enemy. And speech by people like this must therefore be considered hate speech. So, from their perspective. Um, the, the work that the Canadian Association for Equality does is, um, is to try to ar help people articulate uh, something that we consider equal, that is, we consider our fathers and our sons and our, uh, and our, uh, our husbands to be equal in importance in the family to our daughters and our, and our wives and, our, and the mothers. Um, but from their perspective, we are the, the oppressors, and so therefore, uh, we should be kept, we should not be allowed to speak, and that, from their perspective, is not an abridgment of freedom of speech, it is rather the prevention of hate speech. And um, and so that's a very different perspective than what I take. Um, I feel uh, my perspective is that uh, the women's movement has done a great job in helping um, women row, uh, in the old days, before the women's movement, there was a... Um, Men were expected to row, if you will, on the right side of the boat, raise money. Women were expected to row on the left side of the boat, raise children. And um, the women's movement and other social forces helped it so that women uh, would be able to row both on the left side and the right side of the boat, raise children or raise money. But no equivalent men's movement has helped men row on the uh, raised children's side of the boat. So therefore, when there's a, a, a difficult time financially and a man can't raise money in a family for whatever reason, uh, women know how to row on the left side of the boat. Men know only how to row on the left side of the boat. And so two people rowing on the left side of the boat only and no, um, makes a boat go in circles. And so from my perspective, when, when either sex wins, if that only that sex wins, then really both sexes lose because it makes the family boat very much less flexible. And so what I have learned is that there is a huge amount of problems occurring with boys, not just in the U.S. and Canada, but in almost every country, all of the 35 most developed countries in the industrialized world. And there are about 12 significant reasons for the, the problems we're having. Ten of those reasons have causes. Two of those reasons, one is peace and the other one is industrialization, are not, are not um, 
causes of the boy crisis for which I am searching for solutions. I want peace and I want industrialization. But the other causes are causes that have solutions. And that's what I was trying to articulate. Uh, but the tactics that were used by this Socialist Workers' Party group were not just tacti tactics of protesting, tactics that um, Ian and I and the uh, cafe are very much in favor of uh, protests, but we're not in favor of the doors being blocked. We're not in favor of, uh, of all of the posters being put up, being defaced, not some, but all of them either being defaced or taken down, and most of them being taken down within a one to two hour period after they were put up. That is a, an abridgment of freedom of speech, and that is something that I know that um, Ian um, can speak to to a greater degree than I. Ian, uh, would you like to add something to that? Uh, I think Warren covered it uh, quite well. Uh, we, I, I do want to emphasize uh, campus security. What did take this very seriously? Uh, so, from an institutional perspective, I think U of T came out of this fairly well. Uh, it was just some of their students uh, that, or I'm, I don't even sure how many of them actually were students and how many were um, were just protesters. Uh, but U of T uh, did re did respond very well. Uh, they they respond. So their security response was quick, uh, and they, I think, in my opinion, they handled it very well. Uh, it was just the yeah the lead up to the protest. Uh, we did have uh, you misquoted or in your quotes taken out of context. That was a popular tactic. Uh, the defacement we already talked about, uh, and then finally, what's surprising me most though is sort of the the runaround we are getting from some of the some of the organizations that are associated with universities. Uh, I already mentioned our, our, our club ratification at U of T has been delayed by student council. Uh, we submitted it back in August. Uh, there was there's a whole problem we had there just getting a table to set up with uh, for Frosh Week, uh, which is you know the, this, that's the best time of year to get new members for clubs, and nobody had any tables for us. We were repeatedly told to leave, uh, that we weren't wanted there, that kind of thing, uh, and then finally now, uh, as I mentioned before, with the School of Social Work. Um, one of the students there forwarded an email to us saying that they thought it was very inappropriate, uh, very inflammatory, I think was his exact words. And when I went in to talk to the school, the administrators there, they were very dismissive. They really, they obviously didn't want to talk to me. And it, it took a very, and to this day, we still haven't really properly received an answer from them whether or not that email had the sanction of the School of Social Work. Uh, the, the campus papers there, uh, I let them know they are looking into it, and hopefully uh, they can find out some answers where I couldn't. Warren, would you take a moment and just talk about the cost to women and uh, of not having this voice heard, and girls, and uh, you and I grew up in the era, my mother was uh, very pro-opportunities for women in Washington, D.C., and it almost seems dis, uh, disrespectful for all the hard work she did to open up opportunities for women. Uh, and moving it to a, a new way of attacking men. So could you yes. talk on this some? Yeah, the, there's a huge, uh, this is really a very important point that you're bringing up, Martin, which is that, that, that it wasn't the intent of 98% or so of feminists and people leading the women's movement to, to, um, to have male hating or the undervaluing of the family be a part of what the, was core to what the movement, women's movement was doing. And so we have that happening now, and th and that is that's really a that's really a uh, huge mistake. Uh, and the way this is hurting the family is that, uh, for example, when um, right now in the United States, 53% of the women under 30 who have children, 53% are having children without being married. Now, why is that? We have trained women to only marry men when they expect that those men will earn as much or more than they do. And so women, when, when men are beginning to have a failure to launch, when they're not doing as well in, in the job market, when they're being left out of, uh, of jobs, uh, women are saying, well, if, if I don't have a man that's earning about as much as I am, um, then, I'm going to, then I'm going to not marry at all. I'll raise the children by myself. And then she doesn't, but very few people know that children that are raised without an, about an equal amount of father involvement or in an intact family, that those children are almost always, not almost always, 
about a third to a half of the time, those children have significant problems. They either have significant problems in terms of empathy, they have significant problems in terms of assertiveness, they have significant problems in terms of math, science, and every academic subject. They have much greater health problems. They're more likely to have nightmares. They're more likely to have problems with sleep. They're more likely to have um, so, uh, social skill problems. Um, they're more likely to be depressed, delinquent, um, use drugs. Uh, they're more likely themselves to have children out of wedlock uh, in, in teen teenage years. Um, they're really more likely to be every parent's nightmare. And no mother wants to be oftentimes single mother working full time or very close to full time coming home trying to take care of her children, um, often in poverty type situations, working her rear off without the support of a man and because she she's learned to not marry a man unless he earns as much or more. So when men, when boys don't do well, they become men that women have very little interest in. The job market has very little interest in it in in boys that don't know how to um, be to be to be effective and don't produce well academically and don't have high motivations, and children who are raised without an equal amount of fathering, especially boys, are likely to be suffering in all those categories. So you have a vicious cycle here. Um, you have minimal father involvement, leading to fathers uh, the, the lack of boundary enforcement. Um, and the boy having no role model of, as a, of a dad to be a gift of legacy for him. Uh, that lack of role model produces a lack of motivation. He becomes a, a young man who has a, is of little interest to employers or a female partner. So the woman in his life um, chooses to marry uh, uh, not at all. Um, and then she raising a, um, a, a boy by herself um, ends up with a boy who has a lack of motivation, is not successful, and that per perpetuates the cycle. That's the way it affects women um, as much as it does men. I, I, it also, uh, there's studies of just higher hostility towards women without the support of fathers. Can you mention that and, and even potential violence? Yes. Um, children, boys raised without um, um, without a father are far more likely to have very poor social skills. When pre people have poor social skills, what ends up happening is they uh, they don't, let's say somebody criticizes them, they tend to defend themselves when they're criticized and they sidestep the criticism and they attack the criticizer. Well then if there is uh, if there's further escalation of conflict they don't know how to de-escalate. They only know how to macho escalate. And this happens to, be, by the way, to be true for girls as well that are that are not raised with equal father involvement. We don't know exactly what there is about equal father involvement uh, because we only know that the outcome is this. But what I suspect is involved in father involvement is that fathers are more likely to to tease. They're more likely to criticize. They're more likely to do boundary enforcement so that children, when are, are de things are demanded of children and children have to respond to somebody else's needs besides their own. Children um, raised by moms are uh, much more likely to have a mom who's very empathetic and very protective. Therefore, the child doesn't learn how to handle itself in the world. And if, if a, a mother is constantly empathetic with the child, the child is always thinking of its own needs. Every time it expresses a feeling, its needs are being paid attention to, but it's not learning itself how to be empathetic. Um, by being forced to pay attention to other people's needs besides itself. So there's a huge amount, when I did the research for Father and Child Reunion, um, I learned that there was a huge amount of things that fathers bring to the family table, which um, by leaving fathers out of the family is creating problems not only for their sons, but also for their daughters, daughters that are raised uh, without a, a great deal of, equal, about an equal amount of father involvement are far more likely to have children out of wedlock when they're teenagers, just for an example. They're much more likely to do much worse in school. They're more likely to be have problems with addiction, disobedience, delinquency, and drugs. And so these are, um, these are just a few of the devastating um, steps that this culture, that the industrialized world's cultures um, is, being, is, um, is, is taking all around the world. Well, you know, one of the pieces, uh, Warren, is uh, we wouldn't 
we wouldn't even think in our culture of saying that uh, daughters don't need mothers. I mean, that, that would be so deeply offensive to me to hear. Yes. But it seems like we're almost proud of the fact that uh, sons and daughters don't need fathers. Yes, I don't know that we're proud of the fact. I think most people recognize that that would be a value. But, the, but we're so focused on women choosing and women's rights that when we um, that when a woman says I want to raise a child uh, on my own because I haven't met a good man, um, her women friends come around and support her. They don't do the research that, that I had a chance to do in father and child reunion um, to to say wait a minute before you do that you know let's read up on what is the likely outcome of a daughter raised without a father and a son raised without a fa father. We often think that you know fathers are more necessary for sons than daughters, but actually the evidence isn't very clear that way. It may be slightly more uh, important for fathers, but when daughters don't have fathers, the, as I mentioned a moment ago, they're far more likely to have children out of wedlock. They're far more likely to be uh, very coercive with their mother. They're far more likely to be delinquent, drop out of school, uh, high school. Uh, they're, they're far more likely to be addicted to a number, either drugs or drinking. And so the, the consequences for daughters raised uh, without significant father involvement are almost as severe as the consequences for uh, sons raised without significant father involvement. Well, I want to ask the question next. Uh, this started about the event, and clearly there's, there's two uh, people who have responded strongly to this, the protesters and then the media by the absence of bringing the information forward. Would each of you uh, let us wrap it up on making a statement? What would you say to the, both the protesters and the media if they were open to listening? What would your message be? I'd like to start with Ian and then end with Warren if we can. Uh, if you'd say something, what would you like to say if, you, if, if they, were, go, if they one, were open to hearing both the media and the protesters? Uh Okay, well, especially to the protesters, uh, my message would be, please come talk to us. We want to discuss these issues. We want to come to the truth. Uh, what I saw at the, at the event was not people who were interested in talking. Um, they had already made up their minds, and I, there didn't seem to be much point in engaging with most of them. Uh, that, there were some there who were willing to listen, um, but many of them uh, had already made up their minds. Uh, and to the media, I think you will be surprised at the kind of impact that these issues will have in the coming years. Uh, and I think it would be in their best interest to take a strong, take a strong interest in this kind of thing and give it the coverage it deserves. Excellent. And Warren, would you share? Uh, what you'd communicate to those two groups? Well, I, I would say that I very much agree with the sentiment of the protesters that they want peace and that they don't want, uh, and so how do we create peace? Peace is created by probably the single biggest prerequisite to peace is the ability to listen, the ability to hear what somebody else is saying, the ability to articulate with someone, to someone else what you hear them saying. The, the, the pathway to peace is not blocking doors so that somebody can't come in to hear what somebody else is saying.